from the stage of America's first Elizabethan theater, the Oregon Shakespearean Festival. The National Broadcasting Company, together with its independent affiliated stations, presents the eighth annual radio portrait of the Oregon Shakespearean Festival, broadcast direct from the stage of the festival's outdoor theater in Ashland, Oregon. Between the Cascades and the Siskiyous in the high country of southern Oregon, America's first Elizabethan theater was established 23 years ago in 1935. Today, actors and audiences from all parts of the world bring renewed vigor to the 1958 season at the only theater of its kind in the Western Hemisphere. This year's playbill lists Much Ado About Nothing, King Lear, The Merchant of Venice, and Troilus and Cressida, all four in nightly rotation, performed on a stage patterned directly after the Fortune Theater of Shakespeare's era. And now as prologue to this annual broadcast, here is the founder and producing director of the Oregon Shakespearean Festival, Angus L. Bomer. This is a milestone year for our organization. Milestones are not new to this theater. However, we feel the 1958 milestone to be an especially important one. Not only are we producing our longest season to date, July 28th through September 4th, but we have also just reached a pinnacle shared by very few theaters in world history. With the performance last July 31st of Troilus and Cressida, the Oregon Shakespearean Festival completed the production on this stage of every one of Shakespeare's plays. Next year, Oregon's signal statewide centennial year, we hope to pass another milestone by welcoming 1959 audiences to a handsome new theater plant. On this year's broadcast, we return to the tragedies with a montage of scenes from our 1958 production of King Lear. To order the scenes in the theater of your mind, the broadcast will be narrated by the director who staged King Lear for the Oregon Shakespearean Festival, Robert Loper. King Lear is a story of a man who's grown old without growing wise. In Shakespeare's play, Lear, hurt by a seeming lack of love from his dearest daughter, makes a rash and foolish decision. But the tragic consequences of that decision bring him wisdom. The play also concerns the Earl of Gloucester, whose tragedy parallels that of Lear. Gloucester's illegitimate son, Edmund, ambitious for lands and power, deceives his father. Because Gloucester believes this lie, he is destroyed. William Shakespeare's Tragedy of King Lear, the story of two fathers, how one loses his mind, one his eyes, and how in that loss both find their souls. <laughs> Enter Lear, King of Britain, his daughters Goneril, Regan, and Cordelia, with Cornwall, Albany, and attendants. Know that we have divided in three our kingdom, and tis our fast intent to shake all cares and business from our age, conferring them on younger strength, while we, unburdened, crawl toward death. Tell me, my daughters, since now we will divest us both of rule, interest of territory, cares of state, which of you, shall we say, doth love us most, that we our largest bounty may extend where nature doth with merit challenge? Goneril, our eldest born, speak first. Sir, I love you more than words can wield the matter, dearer than eyesight, space or liberty, beyond what can be valued, rich or rare, a love that makes breath poor and speech unable, Beyond all manner of so much, I love you. <laughs> of all these bounds, even from this line to this, with shadowy forests and with champagnes rich, with plenteous rivers and wide-skirted meads, we make thee lady. Now what says our second daughter, our dearest Regan wife to Cornwall? Speak. I am made of that self-metal as my sister, and prize me at her worth. In my true heart, I find she names my very deed of love, only she comes too short that I profess myself an enemy to all other joys. <laughs> to thee and thine hereditary ever remain this ample third of our fair kingdom, no less in space, validity, and pleasure than that conferred on Goneril. Now our joy, although our last and least, what can you say to draw a third more opulent than your sister speak? Nothing, my lord. Nothing? Nothing. Nothing will come of nothing. Speak again. Good, my lord. You have begot me. 
bred me, loved me. I return those duties back as all right fit. Obey you, love you, and most honor you. Sure, I shall never marry like my sisters to love my father all. But goes thy heart with this? Aye, good my lord. So young and so untender. So young, my lord, and true. Let it be so. Thy truth then be thy dower. Here I disclaim all my paternal care, propinquity, and property of blood. And as a stranger to my heart and me, hold thee from this forever. Would me leave. It can't. I'm not between the dragon and his wrath. I loved her most and thought to set my rest on her kind nursery. Hence and avoid my sight. Royal Lear, whom I've ever honored as my king, loved as my father, as my master followed. Boys bent and drawn make from the shaft. Let it fall, rather though the fork invade the region of my heart. Be Kent unmannerly when Lear is mad. Kent on thy life no more. My life I never held but as a pawn to wage against thine enemies, nor fear to lose it, thy safety being motive. Out of my sight. See better, Lear, and let me still remain the true blank of thine eye. Away! For I, Jupiter, this shall not be revoked. So Lear has set the wheel in motion. The Earl of Gloucester, who has witnessed Lear's fury, later returns to his own castle and encounters his illegitimate son, Edmund. Kent banished thus, and France in collar parted, and the king gone tonight. All this done upon the gad. Edmund, how now? What news? So please your lordship, none. Why so earnestly seek you to put up that letter? I know no news, my lord. What paper were you reading? Nothing, my lord. No? What needed then that terrible dispatch of it into your pocket? Let's see. Come, if it be nothing, I shall not need spectacles. I beseech you, sir, pardon me. It is a letter from my brother that I have not all or read. And for so much as I have perused, I find it not fit for your all looking. Give me the letter, sir. I shall offend either to detain or give it. The contents, as in part I understand them, are to blame. Let's see, let's see. I hope, for my brother's justification, he wrote this but as an essay or taste of my virtue. This policy and reverence of age makes the world bitter to the best of our times. If our father would sleep till I waked him, you should enjoy half his revenue forever and live the beloved of your brother, Edgar. Huh? Conspiracy? Sleep till I waked him, you should enjoy half his revenue. My son, Edgar? Had he a hand to write this? It is his hand, my lord, but I hope his heart is not in the contents. Find out this villain, Edmund. It shall lose thee nothing. Do it carefully. And the noble and true-hearted Kent banished. His offense, honesty, is strange. <laughs> So, just as Lear is deluded by his daughter's protestations of affection, so is Gloucester deceived by the ambitious lie of his unscrupulous, illegitimate son, Edmund. Kent, the noble and true-hearted, does not accept his banishment. His loyalty to Lear, compulsively honest, bids him return in disguise to serve his master. Oh, no, what art thou? A very honest, harpied fellow, and as poor as the king. Oh, if thou beest as poor for a subject as he is for a king, thou art poor enough. <laughs> what services canst thou do? Oh, I can keep honest counsel, ride, run, or a curious tale in telling it, and <laughs> deliver a plain message bluntly. Follow me, thou shalt serve me. If I like thee no worse after dinner, I will not part with thee yet. Oh, let me hire him, too. Here's my coxcoat. Oh, now, my pretty fool, how dost thou? Sirrah, you were best take my coxcoat. Why, fool? Why? For taking one's part that's out of favor. There, take my coxcoat. <laughs> Why, this fellow has banished two and's daughters and did the third of a blessing against his will. Oh, if thou follow him, thou must needs wear my coxcomb. <laughs> How oh, now, Nuncle? Would I had two coxcombs and two daughters? Why, my boy? If I gave them all my living, I'd cheap my coxcomb myself. There's mine. Beg another of thy daughters. Take heed, sir, of the whip. Truth's a dog, Muster Kennel. Ah, pestilent gall to me. Lear's awakening to his own helpless position begins when Goneril's servants rebuff him and he is asked to reduce the number of his train. And at Gloucester's palace, Edmund accelerates his plan for power. Brother, away! He says, brother, I say! Ah, a 
Have you not spoken against the Duke of Cornwall? Advise yourself. I'm sure on it. Not a word. I hear my father coming. Pardon me. In cunning, I must draw my sword upon you. Draw. Seem to defend yourself. Now, quit you well. Yield. Come before my father. Fly. Ho. Ho. Fly, brother. Torches. Torches. So farewell. Father. Father. Stop. Stop. No help. Now, Edmund, where's the villain? Here stood he in the dark, his sharp sword out, mumbling of wicked charms, conjuring the moon to stand auspicious mistress. But where is he? Fled this way, sir. When by no means he could... Ho, go after him. <laughs> by no means what? Persuade me to the murder of your lordship. Oh, let him fly far. Not in this land shall he remain uncaught. And found dispatch. All ports I'll bar, the villain shall not scape. And of my land, loyal and natural boy... I'll work the means to make thee capable. Lear, smarting from the sting of Goneril's criticism, looks for sanctuary with Regan. As a storm blows in across the wild heath, he finds both Goneril and Regan at Gloucester's castle and finds, too, the totality of his helplessness. Is this well spoken? I dare avouch it, sir. What, 50 followers? Is it not well? What should you need of more? I gave you all. And in good time you gave it. Made you my guardians, my depositaries, but kept a reservation to be followed with such a number. Hear me, my lord. What need you five and 20, 10 or five? What need one? No reason not the need. Our basest beggars are in the poorest thing, superfluous. You unnatural hags. I will have such revenges on you both that all the world shall... I will do such things. What they are yet, I know not. But they shall be the terrors of the earth. You think I'll weep? No, I'll not weep. I have full cause of weeping. But this heart shall break into a hundred thousand flaws or ere I'll weep. Oh, fool, I shall go mad. <laughs> Lear, accompanied only by his fool, wanders across the storm-lashed heath, feeling discomforts he has never known before, feeling an aloneness he has never known before. Blow, winds, and crack your cheeks! Rage, blow! You cataracts and hurricanoes, spout you have drank star steeples, drawn the cocks! You sulfurous and thought-executing fires, vaunt carriers of oak-cleaving thunderbolts, send my white head! And thou, old shaking thunder, strike flat the thick was under the other world. Crack nature's molds, all German spill at once that make ingrateful man. Oh, Nuncle, caught holy water in a dry house is better than this rain water out of door. Good Nuncle, Ed, at thy daughter's blessing, here's a night pities neither wise men nor fools. Rumble thy belly full, fit fire, spout rain. Nor rain, wind, thunder, fire, my daughters. I tax not you, you elements, with unkindness. I never gave you kingdom, called you children. You owe me no subscription. Then let fall your horrible pleasure. Here I stand, your slave, a poor, infirm, weak, and despised old man. But yet I call you several ministers that will with two pernicious daughters join your high engendered battles against a head so old and white as this. Oh, tis foul. <laughs> faithful Kent finds Lear and the fool in the storm, leads them to a protecting hovel, where they find the hunted Edgar in his disguise as poor Tom of Bedlam. Gloucester takes pity on Lear, hears a plot against the old king's life, and learns that Cordelia and the French forces have landed at Dover. He urges Kent to lead the king to Dover in safety. In the meantime, Edmund sees the key to his victory by informing Regan and Goneril that Gloucester's treason has brought the forces of France. Bring in the traitor Gloucester. Hang him instantly. Pluck out his eyes. Leave him to my displeasure. Ingrateful fox. Bind fast his corky arms. What mean your graces? Good, my friends. Consider you are my guests. Do me no foul play, friend. Find him, I say. Hard, hard. Oh, filthy traitor. Fellows, hold the chair. Upon these eyes of thine, I'll set my he foot. He will think to live till he be old. Give me some help. Oh, 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 wild jelly, oh. where is thy luster now? Oh, dark and comfortless. Where's my son Edmund? 
Edmund, and kindle all the sparks of nature to quit this horrid act. Oh, treacherous villain, thou callest on him that hates thee. It was he that made the overture of thy treasons to us, who is too good to pity thee. Oh, my follies. Then Edgar was abused. Kind gods, forgive me that and prosper him. Go thrust him out at gates and let him smell his way to Dover. Gloucester, blinded, is pushed from his own gates to wander in darkness. His son Edgar, still in the guise of poor Tom, finds him and leads him to safety. So it is that both Lear and Gloucester have reaped the reward of their delusion, have tasted the hatred of their children, and have come to complete rejection. One mad, the other blind. It is thus that they meet. Dost thou know me? I remember thine eyes well enough. Dost thou squinny at me? Were all thy letters sons I could not see? Get thee glass eyes, and like a scurvy politician seem to see the things thou dost not. <laughs> if yet thou wilt weep my fortunes, take my eyes. I know thee well enough. Thy name is Gloucester. Thou must be patient. We came crying hither. Thou knowest the first time that we smell the air, we wall and cry. I will preach to thee, Mark. Alack, alack the day. When we are born, we cry that we are come to this great stage of fools. This is a good block. It were a delicate stratagem to shoe a troop of horse with felt. Now put it in proof. And when I have stolen upon these sons-in-law, then kill, 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 kill. From the horrors of the heath, Lear gains a brief respite, reaches the French forces, finds Cordelia, and the strength of her honest love. Sir, do you know me? You are a spirit, I know. Where did you die? Still, still far wide. Where have I been? Where am I? Had daylight? Oh, I am mightily abused. Oh, look upon me, sir, and hold your hands in benediction over me. No, sir, you must not kneel. Do not laugh at me. For as I am a man, I think this lady to be my child, Cordelia. And so I am. I am. Be your tears wet? Yes, Faith. I pray weep not. If you have poison for me, I will drink it. I know you do not love me. For your sisters have, as I do remember, done me wrong. You have some cause. They have not. No cause. No cause. Am I in France? In your own kingdom, sir. Do not abuse me. Wilt please your highness walk? You must bear with me. Pray you now, forget and forgive. I am old and foolish. But the peace of reunion is short-lived. The armies of Edmund triumph. Lear and Cordelia are taken prisoner. Regan and Goneril quarrel over Edmund, and Regan dies from poison given her by Goneril, who then stabs herself. But the wheel has come full circle, and the discoveries of treason come too late to save Cordelia from death, or Lear from his inevitable tragedy. Enter Lear with Cordelia in his arms. Howl! 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 Oh, you are men of stone. Had I your tongues and eyes, I'd use them so that heaven's vault should crack. Plague upon you, murderers, traitors all. I might have saved her. Now she's gone forever. Cordelia. Cordelia, stay a little. Huh? What is thou sayest? <laughs> her voice was ever soft, gentle, and low. An excellent thing in woman. And my poor fool is hanged. No, no, no life. Pray you, undo this button. Thank you, sir. Do you see this? Look on her. Look. Her lips. Look there. Look there. He faints. 
My lord, my lord. Break, heart. I prithee break. Look up, my lord. Vex not his ghost. Oh, let him pass. He hates him that would upon the rack of this tough world stretch him out longer. He's gone indeed. The wonder is he hath endured so long. He but usurped his life. Bear them from hence. Our present business is general woe. Friends of my soul, you twain rule in this realm and the gored state sustain. I have a journey, sir, shortly to go. My master calls me. I must not say no. The weight of this sad time we must obey. Speak what we feel, not what we ought to say. The oldest hath borne most. We that are young shall never see so much, nor live so long. You have heard scenes from William Shakespeare's The Tragedy of King Lear. This has been an NBC Radio Network production, supervised and directed by Andrew C. Love, and transcribed on stage at America's first Elizabethan theater, the Oregon Shakespearean Festival in Ashland, Oregon. On our radio playbill, Richard Graham played King Lear, with Jerry Turner as Gloucester, Harold Gould in the role of Edmund, Edward Grover doing Kent, Elizabeth Hiller as Goneril, Rachel Weller as Regan. Rosalind Newport portrayed Cordelia, Robert Towers was heard as the Fool, Claude Jenkins was Cornwall, Paul Harper as Edgar, and George Vafiadis portrayed Albany. The festival singers are Arlita Knowles, James Baker, and Lyman Pruitt. Audio engineer, Ellis Feinstein. Scenes from King Lear arranged for radio by Carl Ritchie, with music by W. Bernard Wint, and directed for the festival company by Robert B. Loper. Technical facilities by Ray Johnson and the staff of NBC's Medford affiliate, KMED. KMED.